Yeah, so I mean, it was interesting. I'm not entirely surprised. Um, you know, it almost seems like it would be too easy for you know all of these big companies just to file for um, for the ETFs on the spot market and just get right through. So I, I think I think the biggest takeaway is initially we saw Bitcoin fall sharply. Right, it went from around thirty one thousand back to twenty nine five, but it's kind of come back to settle in that thirty thousand dollar range. And I think what we take away from this is that. It, it's not horrible news. It's not great news, but it's not horrible. I think it was, I think the term used was inadequate, right? So, yeah. so that doesn't mean it's, they're not shutting it down. They're saying we need more information or we need you to do more due diligence or, or give us whatever we need. And then it seems like it, they're, they're open at least to it getting through. The U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, ETF, said recent filings to launch a spot Bitcoin ETF are inadequate, reported the WSJ Friday morning, citing sources close to the matter. The news sent the price of Bitcoin, BTC, plunging by $1,000, or more than 3%, in the space of a few minutes. At press time, Bitcoin was trading just above $30,000. According to the story, the SEC has informed NASDAQ and CBOE, the exchanges that filed the spot ETF paperwork for several of the asset managers, including BlackRock, BLK, and Fidelity, that the applications aren't sufficiently clear and comprehensive. Hello and welcome to Money Talks. In today's video, Gareth Soloway shares his opinion on what SEC said about the Bitcoin ETF. Also, he gives us his chart analysis for Bitcoin. So without further ado, let's get started with the video. But we had the initial reaction, and let me go to the intraday 10-minute chart. Here was that news hitting the market. Again, we were up right against that resistance at 31,000 on the intraday. We flushed down to support, and then we've kind of just trailed off in this lower area here. And the other thing that I thought was interesting, too, is that today was the day that altcoins were starting to pump. And it was amazing how that just took a lot of the wind out of the sails of the altcoins. Like, so if we go to the the daily chart, and you look at Cardano, for instance, Cardano was up into resistance earlier today, looking like it was trying to break out and go to this next level of 33, 34 cents. And that news just slammed it right down. So so by hitting back at Bitcoin and the ETFs, they kind of took out the, the wind from behind the sails of, of the altcoins as well. At issue, the story continued, is that the filings didn't have enough detail with respect to the surveillance sharing agreements, including which spot Bitcoin exchange would be used. The asset managers can update their applications and refile, and the CBOE indicated to the WSJ and to Coindesk that it plans to do so. The SEC said in previous ETF rejection orders that the sponsor of a Bitcoin trust would have to enter a surveillance sharing agreement with a regulated market of significant size. A market of significant size is one where anyone trying to manipulate the price of an exchange-traded product has to trade on the same market the exchange-traded product, ETP, is based on, meaning the agreement would let the sponsor and the trading platform identify any wannabe market manipulators. At present, no federal regulator has oversight of spot Bitcoin markets, a state of affairs the Commodity Futures Trading Commission has lobbied to change for years. BlackRock's spot ETF filing in mid-June had been the impetus for a strong run higher in the price of Bitcoin since, sending the crypto from below $26,000 to one-year highs above $31,000. The BlackRock application also set off a host of filings from several other asset managers, including fellow asset management giants Invesco, IVZ, and Fidelity, both of which refiled for approval of their previously rejected spot Bitcoin ETFs. So, so it's that's such a good question too, is because ultimately, longer term, there's no doubt that having spot ETFs that are brought to the market by Fidelity or by by BlackRock, that's a positive. That's a net positive. But you're right. I mean, we're talking about a year to a year and a half away. The crypto market barely can focus on a week to two weeks away. And so, how do you, you know, when you talk to crypto investors? When, they, when this is so far away, do they stick around? What if, and, and again, this is my bear case, right, for Bitcoin. If Bitcoin is going to revisit its lows, it's not going to, in my opinion, have to do with a new fraud, a new this or new that. Even with, even with Binance, you know, the markets has kind of digested the chance that what the SEC has claimed is true. But 
the bigger question is, if you look at what's going on with the stock market and the, just the relentless upside action we've been seeing in certain stocks, let's say we do all of a sudden get a corrective move in stocks of 10, 20, 30 percent. How does that then affect Bitcoin and the crypto markets? If you see a run for safety, because I don't think at this point yet we have a, you know, Bitcoin is certainly not a safe haven yet. All right. We saw a little bit glimpse of that during the banking crisis earlier this year, but it's really still been trading as a risk asset. But one of the things that I remember vividly from that period, as well as past really panicky sell periods, is that even gold sells off for short amounts of time. And so I think people have to realize that even if you get to be that panicked market, that everything is going to dump. It's people just freak out and they just dump all, all asset prices, even if it's something like gold, which is a safe haven, at least in the short run. So that kind of opens the door for maybe a buying opportunity if that happens, even if a spot ETF has been approved at that point. And let's not forget that the the top on the last cycle was exactly when the futures ETF got approved. So here we see that certainly it wasn't like all of a sudden that was the new bull market. That was actually the top of the bull market when that happened. Separately, U.S. macroeconomic data provided further confusion for risk asset markets more broadly. The Personal Consumption Expenditures PCE index print came in lower than expected and even managed its biggest drop in a year. Breaking PCE inflation, the Fed's preferred inflation metric, falls to 3.8%, below expectations of 4.6%. Core PCE inflation is now at 4.6%, also below expectations of 4.7%. This is the largest monthly drop this year. The Fed may finally be winning the fight against inflation. Despite signals that inflation is slowing, however, markets began to price in a bigger chance of interest rate hikes returning in July. The latest data from CME Group's FedWatch tool put the odds of a 25 basis point hike next at nearly 90 percent. So there, there's there's some things that I'm seeing in these charts. And, and so this is the 10 year yield chart. And what we had was a wedge pattern that was a bullish wedge pattern. We broke out yesterday with that solid economic news that we got the GDP revision at 2 percent. And then today, we had the slightly better than expected PCE number, which kind of brought back in from this next resistance level, which is what to be expected, right? We broke out of the first one, but the second one hasn't been tested yet. It has to pull back. But this is the key, is that are we going to see a bigger breakout on yields if this channel, see this beautiful, this is actually a bull channel. In fact, it's very, very similar to what we've seen on gold play out over the last four years or so, this same pattern formation. And if this starts to break above this line, you at least are headed back to 410 and then maybe the highs of 436 on the 10 year. And the question is, the higher rates go, what do risk assets do? Uh, that's the that's the question I have. And I think I think also what's concerning to me is the divergences that we're starting to see. So if you look historically at the two year versus the stock market or the 10 year versus there's a very clear kind of coordination between what goes on there as well as the markets. And we've seen a divergence over the last, you know, so long, let's say the last six months in the market with these signals. So something weird is going on here, something that is unsustainable if you look historically at the markets and at these other signals. By the way, another signal that I pointed out recently was M2 money supply. So M2 follows like even like every up and down in M2. Well, there's actually honestly been no downs until recently in M2. But you can see the the vertical nature of M2 as it climbs. And in fact, let me see if I can bring this up here so we can all kind of take a look. Um, but as M2 climbs, the market has always climbed. And let me go to the S&P 500. And then let's bring up the M2 money supply here. Let me break this up here. Let me see if I can follow. There we go. Yeah. So, so what we can see here is is if we go and I can zoom and I, well, I want to zoom out for everyone to see this is that if you coordinate this with COVID, there's COVID and there's your money supply increase. And then look at the run as money supply goes up. Then look as money supply flattens and starts to decline. We have this. The problem is, is that this this action here is down money supply while we have been rallying. And that, again, is problematic. That tells me there's something brewing here in the markets. And it may not play out for the next six months. We don't know. But there's some at some point, there has to be a revision back in the markets or in money supply to some central point. So what's your price prediction for Bitcoin at the end of 2023? Tell us in the comments. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.
See you soon with the next video. Thank you so much for watching.